we're standing in front of a painting called Caretaker. And you know, when I first saw this, I immediately figured that Louis was the caretaker. <laughs> and, you know, and taking charge of everything, as cats always do, and at the highest point, of course, oh. dominance. But, um, but this is uh, one of my favorites because it, um, it, it's just such an interesting composition. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of complexity to it, um, but it's, it's several of your, what I call, sort of icons that, of things mm -hmm. that you, you do. But you also mentioned that it, it, this one took you a couple of years to get it the way you like it. Yeah. But this is another one with the bear, and the fur in this one is incredible, and he's also <laughs> outlined. But um, it's interesting how you, you do line drawings of things like, oh, yeah, well, there's a radiator there, but, you know, I'm not going to give it much attention, you know, and I'm, I'm going to focus on the bear. And so that's what I like about it. But then also the monkey, if people recall, um, the very first vi video clip that we did of this show was a very detailed brown and tan version of the monkey. And here's the monkey again, because as you said, you photographed it, you only had him for three days and he's not yours. And you photographed him and then you, you work from those photographs right. and from different angles and what have you. And sometimes he pops up full of fur and sometimes he pops up as a, as a cartoon or a line drawing. And, and truly on this one, the monkey actually came from uh, my little book, which I was thinking about another painting. And so I was trying to figure out the composition, and if I put the monkey in that painting, where would it go? So that little drawing, I blew it up to, you know, something that was maybe two inches tall mm -hmm. at, at tallest is now this big. And that's the fun thing about the process that I can do. But it's also, scalable. I yeah. liked it the way that it, it played off of the, the quasi-realism or, you know, the, that bear. And, uh, and then also the kind of uh, shadowy, uh, lesser described cat. Mm -hmm. um, they are, uh, so in this piece, the monkey sort of anchors in there. I also like the fact that, that it's a drawing, so it, it looks like it's done on a wall, yeah. like a person might draw on the wall. Yeah, like a kid did it. Usually it's kids, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm sure you still do it as, even as an adult, but go on. <laughs> And so it's like... <laughs> I, I've seen some drawings around walls outside. Anyway. <laughs> well, this yeah, so, is Harlem. We well, have, see? So adults are doing that. Uh, this is New York. We have lots of that. <laughs> yeah, so I noticed. All right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, there's something to be said about the walls and what walls are and rooms and what rooms are. And in a painting, that's an open dialogue because uh, why stop there? You know, why stop at what we expect? And mm -hmm. why not push it even further? You know, there's a wall, there's a veil, there's a this, there's a that, there's a door, there's a portal, but there's a surface, there's a shape. All these things all make sense in terms of painting and trying to put together a composition. So I love the idea that there's a door because it's so gimmicky, a door, you know. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's totally illusory, though. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a line. And, and it's not even like, a, it's not perfectly done, uniformly top to bottom, but this little kick out here, indicates yeah. oh it's it's squared off <laughs> so, perspective is being added to yeah, the door exactly yeah. <laughs> so i mean that, that's what i mean is there's these great you know formal moments but yet the other thing too is since you live in new mexico these look like you know adobe walls these, yeah these look like the diamond finish you know You're polished right. adobe walls which is I never, what i like okay so you know because you lived in new mexico too and uh, you know how many paintings you see of adobe buildings yes. and stuff like that. And I never wanted, uh, after a certain point of, of doing my paintings, I didn't want to do landscape paintings. And I did actually do them for a short while, but it's a long, long time ago, like 87 to 89 or something. <laughs> and then I stopped. And uh, anyway, so I never realized how I'm, I'm still doing it on some level. Yeah. I am painting adobe walls, but I don't really realize it. They're just interior. <laughs> because they're the perfect surface. You know, they're the, they're the perfect kind of uh, yeah. painterly surface. You know, they, it is, uh, there's something about walls that is universally like a painting. You know, you trowel it on. Well, if people have not ever been um, to New Mexico or, or out west where there's a lot more of these uh, adobes, the process is a, a diamond finish where it's very highly polished and, and essentially burnished is yeah. what it is but what ha what it is is I, most of the um, painting on adobe though is just by virtue of it being a poor surface and yeah. um, 
and so it absorbs differently because it's very organic with clay. So it the can clay. be patchy. Yeah, it can be patchy, and that's what I think is always so charming about it. I mean, it reminds yeah. you of you know walls in Italy, you know, old uh, Italian villas and things like that, where they're all sort of you know kind of blotchy and model. Think yeah. about cave walls. I mean, how yeah. uh, and things become. Um, uh, things become infused with our oils as we touch them too. Um, yeah. I taught. And so you get this very painterly, just inherently surface, and you've captured that beautifully because it does. It looks like you've walked into an adobe house in New Mexico. So I taught an advanced painting class, and I was trying to kind of inspire uh, these people because they were still kind of figuring out what is it, what, what, what is painting, what do I do with this? And so I told them that my studio is on the top floor where I live. And at the time I had this doggy named Odie who would follow me into the studio every day. And Odie would walk next to the wall and every other step, his hip <laughs> would hit the wall. And after doing this for so many years, there yeah. was a little smudge. Yeah. And I told my students, that's painting. <laughs> that is painting. Painting shows where we've been. It shows who we are. Yeah. It shows what we do. And so these, the staining, the working, the scraping, the sanding, all that is in a painting. Usually in one of my paintings, it might have all of those techniques. Yeah. It might have sandpaper where I'm sanding off a surface and then painting over it. And so you fetish this like surface fetish thing about mm -hmm. painting that I love. But with mine, it's... it's um, it's sort of a lost cause. You know, I always have these ideals of how I'm going to paint something that's going to be so smooth and the surface is going to be so unified, and I can never reach that. So at well, a certain sort point, I accept it. <laughs> these little bands here well, sort they're, of are. They're better, but, <laughs> but they're still like, they're troweled. There's some yeah. texture. Some of them are a little meltier than the others. <laughs> um, but that, you know, to me, that's, that's the fun part of painting is that mm -hmm. it's, it, there's an activity to the surface. There's an activity to putting the paint on the surface. Right. And then you get hung up about it. Yeah. You know, oh, I, he does it so well. He uses this <laughs> little, little thing and he makes it go so good, you know. But eh, it falls apart. Yeah. It all falls apart. It's, it's like LSD, you know, like the world starts falling apart. And then we become who we are, you know. Gravity. <laughs> gravity kills. <laughs> there, gravity. Gravity is nature's LSD. Yeah. <laughs> I love that band name. But this one also has my favorite piece that I commented earlier, if people are still with us. Um, this picture here where it looks like, oh, I think that's cool. I'm just going to like tape it on there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you didn't even bother to unfold it. <laughs> but what I love about this process is the detail of how that just looks just like, you know, the, it came that out of a book. That old etching or yeah. whatever it was, and, yeah. Yeah, an etching. And so I, I'm just stunned at how I think people should play with that because um, it's amazing uh, the you know, when you see it in person, how fine the lines mm -hmm. are, you know, and it's just incredible. I, I'm so impressed with that whole thing. I just, I can't it's even... A, it's a very cool technique. I see um, how you get addicted to using it. Yeah, you can. And, and, it, and you know, so, so using it in, in a situation like this is, is even more fun because there's a lot more unknown. So in the bear, I have like easily five different layers of this technique that isolates a variation of this honey-toned mm -hmm. bear fur. And uh, to get him to the point to where he's illusionary, or uh, I don't know what's the right word, to where he looks realistic. Yeah. And uh, um, so there's there's that many, and within there, there there's a uh, there's there's real work to try to put it together because I'm having to register the wet paper each time. So it, it's a commitment. It's an act of love. You know. Mm -hmm. You know. There's a there's a point to where you're having to save something. You know. Like yeah. don't don't let it fall apart. You know. Well, that's why th these paintings, I think that's what's sort of amazing about them, is if they were collage, they would go a lot quicker. But yeah. like a painting like this would probably, especially if they're oil, I mean, we're probably talking months. Oh, it takes a long time for oil to dry, for sure. Well, no, but even just the, each process, I mean, it has to dry, but even just the process itself, like what you were describing, just on the bear alone, yeah. you probably revisited that like, what, seven or eight times? Oh, <laughs> way, more, more. way more than that. And yeah. so, I mean, it's... It, it's amazing. So that's why you you have a lot of things going on in simultaneously. Yeah, in, I in usually the, have about anywhere from on the low end five to seventeen things going wow. on at once. But uh, not to say that they're all going to happen real fast either. It's partly because I am waiting for something, but also because I don't want to. I don't like the idea of giving one painting your everything. Mm -hmm. um, it just uh, it it seems better if some. If, 
I think as, for myself as a painter, it's better if I'm actually tempered that I have to slow down mm. um, so that I can think about it. Right. So that I can actually find out something I didn't know. Um, if I was so damn good at well, getting my idea done, I think that's also why boring. you keep adding and doing things in paintings if you have multiple of these going on um, at the same time. Because if you've done something or had an epiphany with one, I can see where you might want to like tweak it on another. And I can see how this could becomes like a, f a feeding frenzy <laughs> when you've got them going on, it, multiple ones in the studio. But I never realized that. Um, until I really just had to dive in and write about this show and about this work, um, I just never realized how labor intensive each of these elements was. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> it just totally changes your appreciation for this because to keep engaged, it's like when you write, you know, um, it's hard sometimes when you have to break it into bits and then have to go back and revisit it because you got to get back into that headspace. Yeah. You know, and with writing, it's not like you just look at it like the picture, you know, it, it's like with writing, you got to go back and reread passages and think, because especially if you've edited them along the way, you know, it's the same thing. You've got to get back into that mind space mm -hmm. and go back and think, and you move along, especially if you're writing a book chapter or something, and you got to go back and think about how did I, I know I tweaked that back there, so I want to make sure these tie. So it's always the same thing. It's, it's the longer and the bigger something is you're making, it becomes infinitely longer. It, seems, it feels like the complexity level just goes infinitely up. And so it's, That's the crafting. it's always that, yeah, revisiting and going back and making sure everything you have harmonizes. And that's what I like about your paintings, I think, is that they feel so put together there's a maturity about them there's just something that they just hang you know um together because you you've just become so you you've you've really worked on your your sensitivity a, about the the process the medium <laughs> the imagery and 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 sort of like your own philosophies and so you're triangulating a lot of things as you before you put these out into the world and so I think it's kind of, it really yeah, shows I, that, you know, that happens as you become a more a mature artist and just you, you really kind of think through about who you want to be, what you want your work to be, what you want it to say when it goes out the door. In a lot of ways, it's easier to know what you don't like. You know, exactly. it's really easier to know what you don't well, like. Well, but that helps how too. To, yeah. At least then you don't incorporate that, you know. D not to incorporate, not yeah. to fall for it, not yeah. to, you know, not to be, uh, yeah, not to be fooled There's by a lot it, of yeah. authenticity in your work and, and, uh, and you know, very genuine. And I think that's really powerful. So that's why I think this yellow one is a, I, I love this little piece. In fact, I just now noticed that this character, you with the mask, um, is actually in a couple of these. It's this one and another small mm -hmm. one. So this is the smallest one, uh, a small one is not the smallest one in the show, but this is one I was looking at when we were talking about that. But you can see a number of the different icons in here. The dollar store shows up again. And this is a, a common thing in New Mexico. It's spicy. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's spicy, spicy. But um, I see what you mean about how this could be harder to do a smaller painting because um, it's got to be cohesive and really stand out. And, and but that's the nice thing about your smaller works is they really can hold a big wall because they are dynamic. There's, you know, the, the, this yellow is a great color, but there's a lot going on in it. So uh, this intrigues me. I don't know what that's all about, but I like it. It's it has Dunkin' Donut colors. Oh, the pink and the orange, yes. Okay. Because <laughs> I, I, I don't like Dunkin' Donuts, but I, I love their colors. You know, like I asked this woman to go with me to Dunkin' Donuts once, just once, uh -huh. so I could get something so I could have a piece of packaging that would have those <laughs> colors so I could tape it to my wall and somehow be with those colors. And so I wanted to see how those colors would feel here. And they were too loud, so I had to put some white over them to kind of tamp them down. Yeah. They were too, they were too bright. And, um, and yeah, so I have a friend who's a physicist, and um, he uh, was working on some element of the uh, RNA behavior and something. Yeah, as you say, this is, yeah. You know, you know. And, and of course, COVID was happening, and mm -hmm. there's all these weird stuff going on. My father loved light beer. Uh, you know, these things just follow me around, and I don't know where they're going. You know, it's like I, I met a friend, something significant about that friendship. I, I keep with it. I keep it with mm -hmm. me, probably 
for the rest of my life, as long as I'm able to still retrieve that information, right. it's still with me. So I don't know what to do with it. So, you know, in life, you, you can have like scraps of things. So it's not unusual for artists to have scrap boxes yep. where something about that color is so important. I have to keep it with me the rest of my yeah. life uh, because I love that color. Mm -hmm. It's just a little piece of paper so big. So eventually it relates, you know. Um, my first full-time job in Santa Fe was working at 7-Eleven. And so I think those colors come from 7-Eleven. Yeah. You know, and um, as a kid, my sisters worked in a, uh, um, in a gas station, like kiosk or whatever, like one of those gas station things in the mm -hmm. 70s. And they had every cigarette and every Tic Tac of every color. And I thought there was something amazing about a person knowing exactly which one they wanted. <laughs> like, no, I don't want that one. I want the Benson and Hedges, you know? Or I want, the, I want the Newports, you know? And I would look at that package of Newports and I would just fall in love with the colors and the design. Yeah. Like, and I would think that spiritually somehow that person was spiritual with that design, like that's me. I'm, I'm the green with the white and that little chevron thing. That's me. You know? So now that explains sort of your, your uh, sensibility with uh, <laughs> consumerism and brands and, and all yeah. that and the colors and the iconography. But it's funny you mentioned 7-Eleven because you know, you know Danny McCoy, right? He, yeah. Yeah, he lives in New Mexico too. Um, Danny is obsessed with all subs. <laughs> yeah. I've so, seen that. They're in a lot I love of that about his work. And he thinks they're the biggest cultural icon ever. I love the characters. They're, they're this meeting place. And he talks pe to everyone. He'll go in and just talk to people, just kind of hang out. And stuff. He loves uh, Alsops. I just think it's so funny. And they're in his paintings and stuff. So I know what you mean. It's just, yeah. and, and they are a big deal in New Mexico. I mean, I've known this about him. And I've known, I've known his work where the, he has like a little hot sauce package that's, oh, yeah. a, that's a character. Yeah. And I love that. But somehow I never thought of that as as being a connector but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he, he loves all that sort of stuff and consumer culture and everything and but he grew up you know it, with, with that and it was all sort of the rage at the time and but like he said it was a hangout when he yeah. was a kid and he when he first came to Santa Fe he was at that all subs over by um, he worked at that all subs and he was, was living across from the sunshine or sunrise cafe they're on oh, St. Michael. Oh, I know Michael. where that's at, yeah. Yeah, it's gone now, it's you know, the shopping center, but when you first came, that was housing there on that side, I guess, or something. <laughs> so anyway, but yeah, that's why, that's, and so Sunshine Diner ends up in his, a lot of his, his things because that, it's got that big egg. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, so painters come from different places. Yeah. So, and, um, and consumer culture is definitely a gateway. I think painters do something different with that consumer cultural element, you know, uh, for, you know, for me, I didn't grow up with art lessons. There wasn't, I wasn't taken to a situation where I could actually get any formal training early on. So for me, it was falling into this situation yeah. and actually like this was my getaway. I could draw, I could think like this. Yeah. And then when it was okay for me to start making art, I was lucky enough to get into an arts high school. So um, what I was bringing to it was, I was bringing my neighborhood to yeah. that, but I was also bringing my grandmother's house. I was also bringing, everything with me and, yeah. I, and I, I guess I'm still bringing it. <laughs> well, and that's, you know, there's uh, some other parallels with the, you know, you and, and Danny as well that it struck me was, is um, he loves the cartooning because um, it keeps it kind of loose and he didn't want to do landscape at all. Yeah, I like He really did not. Cool. Yeah, the new ones though, he's trying to come up with a way of, of a twist on them and I think um, he, he's found something that kind of makes his a little bit unique, but they're not traditional landscapes. No. They're definitely uh, trippy. They're very trippy. And, but that comes from his dad, you know, the bike culture, he, Hell's Angels, and just that whole bike oh, culture wow. in San Francisco. So he, that's how he came out of it, was around all those R. Crum and all those guys who did the poster art in mm -hmm. San Francisco. So that's kind of how Danny's came around, and that's why um, uh, cartooning was sort of a natural for him to go to. And so he does like to do things that are a little bit more realist now. And, um, but you know, he like you, he doesn't like it to get too serious and too literal. He still wants to have that sort of fantasy or playfulness or, you know, um, his sort of edge on it or, or twist. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I think that's kind of interesting. And I think it's kind of, I don't know if there's anything about sort of people in New Mexico or whatever, but it seems like it's common 
with a lot of people in, in New Mexico that um, they're very much inspired by a landscape or by things, uh, you oh, know, certain sure. things, but they don't want to be defined that way. They still want to do something different. You know, and uh, that's and it's taken him a while to kind of get his voice. I think and, it might be also, um, w you know, New Mexico kind of catches on to things later a lot of times too. So the whole tattoo cultures and different mm -hmm. things have influenced younger people who are artists now. Mm -hmm. So th their their influences are different than let's say their parents' influences and stuff. Oh, I definitely so see that with the a younger, lot of that. yeah, yeah. I, the younger um, kids when I see their work. Yeah, it's very different. But no, I think that's what's nice about yours is you, um, you want to convey a point, but you don't want it to be so prescriptive and you um, and certainly don't want to take yourself too seriously. So you, you try and keep it a, um, a little light, but at the same time, not so much that. <coughs> I think if I am paraphrasing what I'm hearing from you is you also want to leave it open to interpretation. I mean, these are things that mean something to you, these elements and icons and what have you. You coalesce them in a way that means something to you and that compositionally you, you like. And, and other people engage with them for entirely different reasons that can still riff off of them. <laughs> I, I think you're hitting on it. I, I, don't, I do think, though, that for me, a lot, of the, a lot of the conscious part of my being in making the work is actually knowing what I don't. Uh, so well, that's I, an interesting point you've made now twice. Yeah, it, it's it's like I know I mm -hmm. know who I'm not mm -hmm. more than I know who I am. Yeah, and so I find out who I am by knowing who I'm not, and and maybe each painting is is sort of a little scenario of that. Mm -hmm. Each painting is an opening, and so how do I complete that that open idea? And the way I complete it is by denying it from going certain mm -hmm. places that I know I'm not, or that it shouldn't be, or that I don't want it to be. No, I think and it's so, very powerful. And that reminds me that it, back to this Anna Navarro thing. Is, and that's why she says, well, what do you want to do? I don't really know, <laughs> you know, uh, but I know what I don't want to do. Yeah. And she goes, well, that's the best way to start. <laughs> so, you know, so kind of went through and ticked off those sort of things. But I told her, I said, I like hunting and gathering. I like searching, yeah, researching. I, I like looking for things or I like being surprised by something and then wanting to investigate why does that intrigue me? What do I like about that? And that's how I am a lot of times with when I select artists. People say, well, how do you pick your artist? Well, it's hard to say, you know, because I don't have a formula. Um, first of all, I have to like them. I have to like the work. I've got, you know, I have to, and, you know, there has to be something behind it. There's got to be something to it. I just don't like, like you said, I don't like things that are this sticky or that are just yeah. popular, you know, or trendy or whatever. I like it when Even people... Even labels. I don't like labels. Yeah, and I like it when people sort of organically find what they're doing and have that sort of epiphany and, and 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 that's what I think is fun about working with artists who are you know emerging and sort of mid-career because sometimes the mid-career people have some of their strongest work because you've they've gone through that process I don't like this I love this yeah. you know but what is it I like about this and how do I there's make a it mine and, yeah and so that's why I you know I say there's a maturation that happens when when artists get to that point because the works look finished they, they look thoughtful. They don't look like something's missing. Um, yeah, and that's where it should be. A painting should, that's when you know something is finished, is when it doesn't need you anymore. You know, uh, uh, you know so that's, that's the only way I know a painting is finished. It's yeah. when I'm unnecessary to it. <laughs> Otherwise, if it still needs me, I need you to clean up this area over here because it looks bad. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do it. All right. But, you know, that's, that's when you know, that's when I know something is done is when it doesn't need me. Right. Good point. I like that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. This was really great. Uh, I knew you would be fun to talk to. I knew this was going to work out just <laughs> thank great. Thank you all for watching. So, <laughs> and again, subscribe, sign up, and um, we will see you the next time. Thank you.